Welcome to another episode of 30 Minutes with DailyStraits.com. This is your host, June Rumley. Our guest today is New Zealand-based entrepreneur Kim Ray. Kim is a former New Yorker who has worked in the fashion industry at the likes of Ralph Lauren before starting her, her own wholesale clothing design and manufacturing business at the age of 23. Her business worked for large American retailers such as Saks, Macy's, Nostrum, Brooks Brothers, etc. to design and produce items or collections specifically to their markets under their own private labels. From there, Kim bought around the world plane ticket with her husband, got married in Las Vegas, and decided to move to Wahiki Island to raise a family. She bought a vineyard and an olive grove, Cypress Ridge, on Wahiki and was meant to slow down, but once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur. So in 2011, she set up Stay Wahiki. Stay Wahiki is the accommodation booking agency team with a portfolio featuring some of the island's most luxurious lodges, romantic hideaways, and boutique beachside beaches um, to cover all price points. The pandemic has also uh, been an incredible tough uh, time for the islanders, but Kim and her team has have huge hopes for this summer to see a huge influx of domestic travelers. And so our chat with uh, Kim today from New Zealand would, re would revolve around her business and much more. So glad to see you, Kim, after many, many tries to get you on the podcast. So how are you? Oh, hi, June. Thanks for inviting me to speak on your show today. I'm great. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. So let's dive right into the question. So Kim, you've got a very, very interesting um uh, like life, your background. So uh, please tell us about yourself, especially like why did you leave New York? Like everybody wants to go there and work there. You left it and you came to um, across the world to Wahiki Island in New Zealand. So come on, like, give us the whole snip uh, lowdown. Sure, sure. So um, I grew up on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, my family is originally from Boston and has been for many generations. They've been living in New England in the New York areas for such a long time, back to the 1600s, really. Um, I know this because I've recently been doing some Ancestry.com research, which is quite fun. Um, I'm one of three girls. I'm the middle child, and I moved to New York City to live on my own when I was 19. Um, I think the person I describe now is probably different from the 20-year-old version of me. So I thought maybe I'd just give you a little insight um, to both. Awesome. Yeah. So um, why a lot of people are, like I said, like a lot of people are trying to move to New York, but you left and moved to Wahiki Island. So tell us the backstory there, like what happened and how did you discover Wahiki Island? All right. Okay. So um New York City is a, a place full of energy, as we all know. Um, as a 19-year-old person in that city of lights, I kind of think of that Alicia's, Alicia Keys song, um, the concrete jungle where dreams are made of. You know, I was 19, um, moved to the city, and was able within five years to find my passion and create a business that I ran for 15 years there in a very competitive um, industry. And how did you discover Wahiki Island from New York City? Like, was it on a holiday, on an internet search? Uh, yeah, no. So my um, husband and I, as you mentioned, we, um, after leaving Manhattan after 20 years, we bought a couple round the world plane tickets and set off on an adventure. Um, my husband's originally from Europe and has family in Australia, in Perth. So I'd never been to this part of the world. So we sort of hopped on the plane and came to Auckland, spent a month here touring around. Um, again, this is after 20 years of working. So we were on this long holiday, which was brilliant. Um, we didn't discover Waiheke on the first time we visited New Zealand, but subsequent trips, when we made the ultimate decision to move here, we were in Auckland looking for our place that we were going to settle. And my husband said, oh, let's just go to this place. And um, it's famous for hiking, nice beaches. It's got vineyards. We'll go over there and have a day. So we came over and we literally made it from the ferry to the first village. Uh, we stopped at a real estate office, met some nice lady. And, you know, 15 years later, that's the story. 
So what was it like? What what made you tick? Like what? Um, I think that because we were in Manhattan for so long, and most people that work in Manhattan, it's not a very big place. They live or have homes outside of the city. So on the weekends, you experience being outside the city. I had a home on um, a little island called Block Island, and my husband grew up on the island of Capri in Italy. And so both of us were kind of island people to begin with. Manhattan's an island. Mm -hmm. So when we were looking for a place to settle in the Auckland area, which is where we decided to settle, um, most of the suburbs were kind of looking a little bit similar to what we were leaving. So we were kind of looking for something different. And when we set foot on the island, it's only 35 minutes by ferry. So we have, and we've got, now we've got about mm, almost 10,000 full-time residents at the time, it was probably closer to 8,000, but 1,500 or so were commuting each day. So it was an easy thing because we were used to commuting into Manhattan at times too. Awesome, okay. So um, let's go back a bit about your uh, life when you were a fashion designer uh, in New York. So what was the name of the clothing line and like, what happened to it? Oh, so the company, um, I started um, a company called Kimberly Glenn um, as I was 23 years old at the time. Um, that was 1987. And the first, I'll, I'll back up even a little bit more, is that my first job in fashion was when I was 19 years old. My aunt was influential in the fashion business. And when I decided to move to Manhattan, she helped me get my first job. And my first job was um, in a business that manufactured clothing for other retailers under their own label, private label is what's called. So a few years on, it was it was a really growing industry and I recognized sort of a, a niche in the market and I created this business on my own, on my very own. Um, I have a memory of um, going to work at three o'clock in the morning and picking and packing 1200 pairs of shorts to get them all ready for the UPS man to pick them up at nine. It was literally on my own. And the first year I had my business, it did over a million dollars in sales just, just because of the timing and, and the luck really. And I realized early on that I couldn't fund and manage this on my own. So I went into business with one of the factories that I was producing products with, which was really sort of a, in hindsight, an amazing thing to do because it was a like-minded business that was able to help facilitate my business and make it only better. So um, a partnership was born there and we were business partners the entire time. My husband, my current husband, um, was my business partner, a second business partner. There were three of us. And for 15 years, we grew that business together. Um, before we left, it was just at 9-11 and the New York economy was changing. It was going from really the strong 90s into you know, the quiet 2000s. Um, I was in Manhattan on 9-11. Um, I was fighting a fertility battle, you know, thinking I'm, I'd like to start a family and I can't really do that when I'm running this company full time. So we made the decision to leave. So you sold it or shut it? No, or? So, um, our, if you went back to my old office is still there. The sign is still up. Our, our third business partner, the one that I started with ori originally, Larry, is still running the company. Um, however, it's a very different business today um, combined with many factors, but um, COVID has really hit New York City and the fashion industry very, very, very hard. Um, so I'm not 100% sure where it'll go from here, but pre-COVID, it was still going. Awesome. So um, as an American, if I um, may ask you, was it easy for you to set up a business in Wahiki? Because I take it that your husband is also not a Kiwi, uh, like uh, not, uh, not Australian, not from New Zealand, right? Uh, no. We we both are New Zealand citizens now. Uh -huh. um, when I started the company, we weren't, um, but that was 11 years ago. And so the, the the laws have actually changed. So when I started the company, it was very easy. Uh -huh. um, now I'm a New Zealander, so I, it doesn't, there's no impact on being American, but the, it is a little bit more complicated now for Americans to start a business here. Not because of New Zealand, but because of America. <laughs> okay, is it the tax? Are you talking yeah. about? Okay. Yeah, it would be the taxing. Awesome. So um, why did you decide to pivot to hospitality tourism, you know, right now from fashion business? Because it's a big jump, you know, it's like, you know, like it's completely A to Z. 
So what was the thinking behind that? Yeah, so when I moved to New Zealand, my job was child minding and child bearing. We came here, my son was two, he's now 17. My daughter, I was seven months pregnant with my daughter. Um, I had my time in fashion and it was over. Um, my husband and I purchased a lifestyle property and on the property, we had three small guest cottages. So that was in around 20, 2009. Um, I love gardening. I love everything about being self-sufficient. Um, when my kids were young, we used to spend quite a bit of time in the garden. They'd have their friends over and play. And um, I was with a girlfriend, um, another mother, and over a few glasses of wine, Stay Waiheke was created. Um, we established the company in 2011. There was a big gap in the market. Waiheke was becoming um, more popular with both domestic and international visitors. Um, but we didn't really have the an eyesight or the real infrastructure to support the guest services side. So we started the company with the goal to support the guests um, in their journey here, but also the homes, the holiday homes here are empty most of the year. So the homes also needed to be cared for. So we were looking after the guests and looking after the homes. Um, we now have 20 staff and we look after everything from the marketing of the homes, the social media side, the bookings, the accounting, the maintenance, everything. Um, and it's going great. So um, how many people are in the business? Is it a family business or do you have an external partner? Um, no, at the moment, it's um, just myself. I, I own the company. There are probably about seven of us on the team that does the management side. But we've got a, a really large housekeeping staff. Um, we we employ um, quite a few Argentinian girls that are you know they're on their OEs or they're a lot of people backpackers traveling around, um, and we become their family over here. So it's a kind of a nice atmosphere. Awesome. So was there a steep learning curve from your end with all these new ventures once you landed in New Zealand? Because like I said, you were like you know coming from the fashion high pace kind of industry, then you landed in New Zealand. It's very slow, and then you pick the different business. So, how did you like help? Like, did you read? What did yeah, you? Yeah, kind of a, a yes. That's a sort of a yes and no question. It was definitely different. Business is different over in New Zealand than it is in America. Primarily, I think I found the biggest challenges around uh, the the employment law, labor laws, the the GST and the taxes, those sorts of things. I mean, in America, we don't even have warrant of fitnesses for vehicles. So all those sorts of things were new and I had to learn a lot about that. But the general, just running a business and you know, business tactics and things were very similar. So did you have a business plan? When no. No. Yeah. No, but I think that one of my superpowers, I think I have two superpowers, but one of my superpowers is that I am quite good at seeing a goal and figuring out how to get there. Mm -hmm. So whether if if I if you asked me if I had a business plan on paper, the answer would be not really. You know, we have a general plan, but I can see clearly that what the what the gap was and what we needed to do to get there by by taking small steps. So I guess yeah. <laughs> okay. So um can you like remember the challenges you faced at the start of the venture like one big challenge that you went through that you thought oh my god I'm not going to do this but you managed to push through and get through Yeah I think that um living on an island is got so many benefits but it's also got some challenges um one of the challenges is is that we are a small community and when we when you're looking after several holiday homes with guests visiting those holiday homes when something goes wrong in the homes the internet doesn't work or the dishwasher explodes or any you know any of those sorts of things we needed to make sure that we were able to react quickly and service those guests while they were in residence and so that we wouldn't disturb their holidays mm -hmm. so we created over over years we've created amazing relationships with the local contractors, whether they're electricians or plumbers or builders, pool servicemen. And um, again, they've, we've sort of invited them into our world and our family. And we all, again, look after each other. Um, my job is to make sure that their bills are paid as quickly as possible and that we don't waste their time. And their job is to make sure that they can get to us as quickly as possible to help us when we need them. Awesome. So here comes the million dollar question. So how did you survive? during 
two years. Yeah, it was it was a long time. And as you know, New Zealand was in lockdown, just like very many parts of Australia for quite some time. Um, it was challenging. It took, a, I think, a mental toll on a lot of us. It was, we, there was no difference in how busy we were. I know that sounds strange, but we went from accepting bookings and managing guests comings and goings to canceling and changing bookings and managing all of that. So our team was really busy, but we were doing it remotely. So we did, as everyone else did, we did lots of Zoom calls, which was sometimes funny in pajamas and we made it fun. Um, but we also had to think a little bit outside the box. Um, I was involved in a really cool project called On the House. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, a group effort with, there were four of us, not stay Waiheke people, but four of us on our team. And we, when Auckland, Waiheke came out of the lockdown, it must have been June, around June 2021, I think, the first one, we were able to get 70 of our homeowners to donate their homes for a two night stay on a weekend in June for free. Mm -hmm. And the guests paid to stay at those homes. And in exchange, we gave the guests back the money in the forms of little cards, Prezi cards, that they could spend in that weekend within our community. Mm -hmm. So we took, we probably injected about $250,000 into our local community in that one weekend. So I guess we did, we did things like that. You know, we, life doesn't stop. And, you know, I've been in business for long enough that, we just needed to find the good part in the pandemic and how we could f get our systems up and running so that when we did open up, we were doing better than we were before. And so, I, mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I just wanted to ask you, during those two years, were you having any cash flow issues or was your cash flow always in the positive that you could like, you know, um, go through the whole two years um, without, you know, letting people go? Like, what was your strategy? So we initially, we did let a few people go initially on our cleaning team. Um, one of them was leaving anyway, and the other one, we just didn't have enough work. We did, we did get a, the government subsidy, which um, was very helpful and kept our staff going. So our staff, all we all went down to um, reduced wages and we worked on reduced wages, but we also worked on reduced hours as well. Okay. So a staff member went down 80% in wages, but they also went down 20% in their working hours. But, you know, there wasn't a whole lot else to do anyway, so we all pretty much worked worked through it. And, and keep in mind that New Zealand was, we were in and out of lockdown, so we did have a good opportunity for um, um, bookings. When the North Island was, was in lockdown, the Aucklanders could come to Waiheke, so we still had a lot of visitors. Yeah. Okay, great. So it balanced uh, the days when there were no bookings out, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say. And I think that if we didn't have the government subsidy, we would have had a much more negative cash flow. Definitely, we had a negative cash flow. We're still recovering, mm -hmm. but we went into it strong enough that we'll, we've will we come out of it fine. Awesome. So um, I've done a bit of research on Wahiki, and I realized um, from Australia itself um, that it's practically more visited by locals, Kiwis themselves, but not often by overseas tourists. Am I right to say this? Uh, probably yes, yes, again, yes and no. So we're a seasonal business. 80% um, of our sales take place between Christmas and Easter. So okay. from December to April is our really busy time. Um, the rest of the year we is winter and it's not so nice here, but it's still nice in winter. Um, the Our visitors are mostly New Zealanders. Mm -hmm. um, in our peak summer period, which is Christmas to the end of January, our forward bookings are looking like about 60% of our bookings are domestic travelers and 40% are internationals. And the internationals would make up of oh, probably 15% Australian, 10% US and Canada, and 10% Europe. And then the rest would be Hong Kong or other parts of the world. Okay, so um, what kind of advice would you have for Americans wanting to follow into your footsteps? Like, you know, cutting all ties with America and coming to New Zealand and starting afresh and thriving like you. 
I think that um, probably the first step I would, would suggest is to do your research. Um, depending on what you're passionate about, really research that and how you can make an impact here in this country. Um, I, a New Zealand is looking for talented, amazing people to come and live here and share their knowledge. Um, the other thing I would suggest is to come visit for not just a week or two weeks, but for a bit of an extended visit so you can get a sense of it, um, possibly in the off season. And then thirdly, I would 100% just trust your instincts. You'll know when you get here. <laughs> awesome. All right. That is all the time that we have for today. We've just been speaking to Kim Ray of Stay Wahiki. Thank you, Kim, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, June. Thank you. The pleasure is all ours. Be sure to join us the next time as we aim to interview another awesome entrepreneur from across the Desmond. Thank you.